Hi, everybody. Welcome today to Hot Planet Repair Team webinar of March 14th, 2023. You're here with me, Jake Fairbanks Kelly, and Tyler Wood to cover Miami Dade County. As you've seen, hopefully, and on one of our previous presentations, we covered the history and future of trashing and untrashing in the Florida context. In this presentation, we're really focused on Miami Dade for various reasons that will become pretty obvious to you of why it's such a critical place to focus on its history of trashing, but also what's going on presently and it should be going on in the future. We all got to care to repair for our people and our planet. First off, a little bit of context for trashing and untrashing in HPRT. We think it's really valuable to have this easy to understand framework of how humanity for hundreds of years has been doing a fantastic job of turning nature into trash. And that had really tough repercussions for our air, as we see with climate change, with our land and our water, as well as us, because we humans are part of our soils. We are 80% water, just like our planet is. Our air that we breathe all the time is what gives us life. The more trash that we put into our air, the more trash we're putting into ourselves. It's also pretty interesting how a lot of archaeologists look at their study as something is studying the waste of humans as a way to understand what humans have done over long periods of time. And it also has a very good record keeping system of species that have failed to adapt. <laughs> Absolutely. One of my favorite ways to look at the history of civilizations is in the health of its soil. Those that did not care for the health of its soil often failed, like you saw in the Middle East, and some of you even claimed with Rome or in the States, we've seen pretty tough things like the Dust Bowl. When you don't care for your soil, you can really ruin one of the greatest bread baskets in the world. If you want to learn more about that, read the book called Grapes of Wrath. Here we're going to focus more is just a little bit on Florida. We're going to go a little bit into the past first, present and future as a, as a good timeline does. Then we're going to map out landfills, incinerators, policy challenges, what are pathways for us to provide better on trashing and diminish trashing, and then what are some of the different stakeholders in Miami-Dade County that are relevant. And you're going to see a lot of great content by other organizations out there, such as these, because a lot of this research that we're showing you here today and analyses is made possible by other organizations out there that have done years and years of wonderful research, which helps us and you like the SWANA Association, the Solid Waste Association of North America. Tyler, would you like to speak briefly about that? Yeah, sure. The beginning of the year, I met with the CEO of SWANA, incredible organization. They have over 10,000 members. They have 47 chapters. Florida is their biggest chapter. A lot of the directors of solid waste management for various counties and cities throughout Florida that I got to meet at their latest conference in February incredible feedback and response to us and what we were doing, as well as what their mission has been for quite a long time. So very happy to be involved with them. I got a lot of insight. One of the interesting things that I did hear, one of the engineers that had been in the industry for a very long time was talking about landfill mining. So I didn't know that that was in conversation in the waste management industry. I thought we were looking at it as a very unique aspect, but various attempts have been made at that. It just hasn't been very economical because they are thinking more about separating trash than separating molecules. We're having several meetings with Miami-Dade County, and their response so far has been very good, as well as the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, FDEP. Wonderful. Yeah, there's other organizations not listed here. Like I forgot to list the Ocean Conservancy, which did one of the best circularity assessment protocol reports. And the first one was in Miami. There's tons of wonderful research you should all check out at the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives. Yeah, uh, I really respect their work, as well as the Energy Justice Network, too. They've shown a lot about how environmental justice communities that are historically vulnerable have suffered the most often from trashing and unhealthy waste management practices. And then the Miami Herald, probably the best journalist institutions or media institutions in the U.S., has done great stuff. The Miami New Times and many others out there. Moving on into the ancient past is the Calusa tribes was one of the most powerful groups in the Caribbean, more towards where Hot Planet Repair Team is based in Naples. But what we're talking about is over here on this side, the southeast of Florida. That's where you really get the Tequesta tribe. It goes all the way up towards Palm Beach County and the Key West. Right here, you find one of the most unique ecosystems in the whole world. That's the Everglades. This big lake, which the Native Americans used to call Big Water, which is directly translated to Okeechobee. That thing would overflow and affect highly the Tequesta and Calusa landscapes. There's a deep history in the land of Florida. For those of you who don't know, it's a big limestone peninsular sponge that is highly affected by the flows of water. There's also a river of grass, essentially, from the Calusa Hatchie down. 
If you could imagine the equivalent water of like the Amazon River flowing over this river of grass that goes from Lake Okeechobee South all the way into 10,000 islands. And I've canoed and kayaked through there and it's absolutely beautiful landscape. Indeed. There's some great books you can check out too around that that we pointed out in our last presentation. Even in downtown Miami, near the Brickell area, you see these ancient artifacts and circles that they found. You can check that out. They have also these mounds where they keep their shellfish remains. They'd stack them up and those could be places they would inhabit. The history of Florida is also very much tied to the history of colonialism with the Spanish up in St. Augustine on the northeast side of Florida. Eventually, you had a lot of Bahamian families move down into the Miami area. Eventually, you had Fort Dallas. Fort Dallas was really one of the first U.S. settlements during the Seminole Wars near the Miami River. So that's really when Miami-Dade started getting a lot more populated by the colonialist folk, the Tequesta tribes. Now there's eventually had to leave for various reasons, whether it was hostility from colonialists or diseases. So you don't see, unfortunately, a lot of those tribes there today. One thing I wanted to really point out, as we mentioned briefly, is that the history of Florida is deeply entangled with the history of water. That's not just shown through the flows of the River of Grass and Okeechobee, like Tyler mentioned, but it's also due to the amount of vegetation that pulls in water through the biotic pump, the hydraulic cycle. If you want to learn more about that and the really interesting science and work being done there with eco-restoration groups, I suggest you check out Eco-Restoration Alliance. I really love the work that they're doing. As the storms show you too with hurricanes, the ways in which humidity and water pressure create storm circumstances in Florida has highly affected the history of it and urbanization. One thing we want to point out here too is why should we care about these storms? Often they create more waste and we need not reactive governance and business, but we need proactive governance and business. So check out this video here, which does a great job explaining this. When the water recedes, much of the leftover debris can be toxic. Common building materials like plaster and wood can contain dangerous chemicals. Drywall decomposes into dangerous hydrogen sulfide gas. Mixing different kinds of waste can cause health hazards. And if the debris is not disposed of properly, it can contaminate groundwater. Typical methods of recycling and solid waste disposal in sealed landfills often cannot be applied after a hurricane because of the sheer volume of waste. State governments overwhelmed with recovery efforts have cut corners in the past. In 2005, after Katrina, Louisiana installed a new landfill next to the Versailles neighborhood that didn't have proper liners or water monitoring equipment. Residents reported that electronic and medical waste was sent to the new landfill instead of more protective sites. Besides the problem with debris, Texas is home to over 40 toxic waste sites. Harvey alone caused damage or flooding to at least 13 of them and at least 80 toxic waste sites were in Hurricane Irma's path. Tyler, do you want to speak a little bit to what you experienced with the waste after Hurricane Ian last September? That was pretty wild because at first we just were admiring the sheer power of the storm through the wind and everything. But then after the few days of recovery, there was a pile of trash. Every street, every alley just had a pile of debris, whether it be yard waste, the flooding, the damage along the coastline. I believe there are still giant deposit points that are like miniature dumps, temporary dumps for staging areas or transfer stations where they just put it somewhere and then they go and collect it and bring it to a designated location at a landfill. But it created so much havoc that they were having to ship trash pretty far distances away because everything was just filling up. It's kind of tragic. And I also remembered that people that were trying to fix some of these houses, if they got cut by a certain area that was infected from bacteria that was brought in from the storm, even get pretty bad situations where people might have had circumstances like gangrene almost. Yeah, I remember one death reporter getting a bacterial infection from cleaning out the debris in the house and yeah, it was pretty bad. Yeah, that's very scary stuff. As we're going to move on to show here is that this is a cycle of ways in which these storms as well as economic development, has been a really critical narrative of the history of Florida. 
As this book shows here, Bubble in the Sun, the Florida boom of the 1920s helped bring the Great Depression. But what was really critical was also the hurricane in 26, which we'll get to in a second. But in Miami-Dade, what you had after the Civil War was the Homestead Act, which enabled people to go get new land. A lot of folks moved down to Miami-Dade. You had people even coming over from the Bahamas, moving to places like Coconut Grove. In 1896, you had Henry Flagler, who brought down the railroads on the east coast of Florida, which really helped get people down to that part of the state. The city of Miami was founded in 96 with 344 voters. Then you started seeing a lot more people moving down there and waste being created when people moved down. As we're going to show here, the 1926 hurricane happened almost 100 years ago, but something that Miami Dade should not forget about. It's 1926. And Miami's economy is soaring, fueled by northerners attracted to its tropical climate and pristine beaches. Through the decade, the population grows from 30,000 to over 100,000 residents. Its blue skies, crystal waters, and swaying palm trees make it the winter party destination for the wealthy. On September 17th, sun worshipers have no idea that a devastating hurricane is sweeping their way. That night, a 60-mile-wide Category 4 hurricane smashes into the city. Nearly 400 people are killed and 43,000 left homeless. News cameraman Ralph Earle is trapped for six hours capturing these images of Miami underwater. It is, perhaps, the earliest known storm chasing footage. Earl, on the left, flies his shocking footage himself to be distributed to the 20,000 movie theaters across the country. The rebuilding cost reaches $109 million, $165 billion today. Worse even than Hurricane Katrina. The University of Miami had just opened a year earlier and christened its teams the Hurricanes. So if that's pretty eye-opening, today, Miami is the US city that is most vulnerable to hurricanes. So let's not forget those cycles of the past. It happened again in 92 with Andrew. That was about $20 billion in damage that hit Miami-Dade County. Since then, these communities have been rebuilt and tourism, transportation continues to be major local industries there. Here we have a video of Hurricane Andrew and one of the Florida citizens talking about how she'll never forget what happened here. Those who survived Hurricane Andrew say memories jarred by old photos still draw an anxious laughter. You don't mess with Mother Nature. <laughs> and you kind of learned that oh, yeah. the hard way. <laughs> For sure. Sharon Wilson lived in Homestead, Florida, ground zero. It didn't seem like they knew we were even had the hurricane in Homestead. It's like they didn't realize it hit there till a couple days. Hurricane Andrew hit at night. I reported from a car. This is a strange position to find myself in. Andrew, one of just five Category 5 hurricanes to ever hit the U.S. What you're looking at is what remains. The aftermath was ugly. Today, significant changes, improved building codes, and better prediction technology. So I think now we have much better ability to predict and observe those types of rapid changes in hurricanes as compared to what we did then. Andrew left 175,000 homeless. Yeah, so without going further in this video, you can see the, the devastation that was caused by Andrew, killing 65 people, destroying 63,000 homes, leaving 175,000 homeless, and generating around 43 million cubic yards of debris. Tyler, how much waste do you think that is in tons? 
That's the technical term for shit ton. <laughs> Indeed. What I also wanted to point out is that through these red areas you see here, with urbanization comes waste. That's become pretty clear with the landfills. Florida is one of the toughest places to have landfills in the whole country because it doesn't have a deep soil level. It's limestone sponge, basically, this whole peninsula. There's a great academic article from Frontiers in 2021 showing the coastal landfills and rising sea levels, a challenge in the 21st century. And here's a great graphic they produced showing Florida's landfills. If you look at Miami-Dade in the southeast of the state here, all of these are in very high-risk zones. We need better proactive planning and infrastructure to make sure that all of that waste isn't going to go in the ocean. That waste goes in the ocean. It's likely going to go up the jet stream, hit my hometown state of Massachusetts, and eventually head over to Europe, probably. Right, Tyler? Yeah, along with the forever chemicals and the leachate and everything else that is a horrible aspect of landfills. Yeah, we're hoping that we can really get the right stakeholders together to get the proactive planning in place. My brother lives in Miami-Dade County. Shout out to my brother, Ryan, and all the other people who, who live there. And those folks, even all, all the way up to Palm Beach County, they will continue to suffer if nothing's really done. What's very clear, too, is the incineration of our waste is quite deadly. Check out the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives and Energy Justice Network to learn more about that. They even have a great webinar on zero waste launch program in the Americas. In this map, you see the trash incinerators in Florida. In Miami-Dade, both of them are located right next to environmental justice communities. So those communities that are often historically affected by various forms of inequality. A great case study to look at was Old Smoky in Coconut Grove, which was built in the 20s, affecting African-American communities that most of them came from the Bahamian islands way back when and helped the, the white settlers learn how to farm their land with this tough limestone circumstances. And these communities are the ones that were affected with the most amount of negative side effects of health. This has led us to a current present situation, not only where people are suffering, but also animals. These ancient sea turtles and manatees, they are suffering the most out of any other state in the U.S. due to plastic pollution in our waters. We're hoping that as the Hot Planet Repair Team, Carbatura is able to get our infrastructure in Miami-Dade County, that we can partner with groups like the Ocean Cleanup, which are doing some of the most innovative work to gather plastic in our oceans so we can collect that and then turn it into high-value commodities. This is a great graphic, which you can find from the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives just on Florida, showing that Florida is the incineration capital of the U.S. Each one of these incinerators has a lot of negative side effects and costs, which can be quantified into financial costs economically, healthcare-wise, in so many different ways. And 10 out of these 11 incinerators are located by those environmental justice communities who really need to be protected. And the federal government has new plans, as you've seen under the Biden administration, to protect those groups as well. Within that same graphic, you can learn more about the negative side effects on health. Tyler, would you like to speak a little bit to this? I know you know a fair amount. Yeah, well, it's just kind of shocking. The industry, as we know it, as far as waste management goes, look towards incineration as renewable because the trash just keeps piling up. However, the people within the industry don't like you calling it incineration. It's like calling a landfill a dump. Regardless of what they term it, it's combustion. It's going up into the atmosphere. Not only are the emissions having a dramatic effect on all life around it, but also the ash is toxic and has other health effects as well. It has further methane emissions just as ash. So there are remediative efforts that we can do to address both the ash and as an alternative to incineration to just remediate the need for incinerators as well as landfills. Thank you, Tyler. One thing I'd also like to point out is you get young kids who in places like Coconut Grove have suffered over decades from lead exposure, from metals being burned. That hurts their development drastically, which many of you should know because of lead issues in other ways which have hit communities. But then you get people of all different ages and sorts suffering from asthma, heart disease, miscarriage, even stillbirth, kidney disease, high blood pressure, and lung disease. And folks that were affected by COVID-19, this made them more vulnerable. A little bit to what Tyler was speaking on there is that a lot of states incorrectly label their waste incineration to energy facilities as a renewable source of energy. That can be very problematic, and there's good groups out there working to change these kinds of policy categorizations. 
like the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives, the Energy Justice Network. But it's important to focus on these risks that are often subsidized. They really create a pollution burden on communities, residents, and even healthcare. I remember while watching the documentary, which we'll show you very briefly about Old Smoky, this old incinerator that was built in the 20s in Coconut Grove, about how Old Smoky was contributing to a lot of negative health effects. And they even considered to build a new facility right next to a hospital that would have made the hospital patients suffer even more than they were in their critical conditions. A good five points that you can find from various articles on Old Smoky or the documentary, which we'll point out in a second. Families always knew this was a humanitarian nightmare. The smokestack was only brought down after schools were desegregated. Toxic ash was found to include arsenic and lead. And they ended up putting this underneath Miami's major parks. I don't know whose idea that was. These poor Black residents forced to live next to the smokestack later developed high levels of cancer, respiratory problems, and fatal medical conditions. If you want to check out a study that's done in a very different part of the world in northern Italy, they show that residents that live close to an incinerator were seven times likelier to die of lung cancer. Here's an other interesting articles, University of Miami and West Grove's churches team up to fight resegregation. This article shows how insanely dangerous Miami's old smoky incinerator was. This one's pointing out new cancer from an old incinerator. We're going to show you a quick clip in this documentary that points out a bit more about Old Smokey and the communities that had to suffer from Old Smokey's issues. Old Smokey initially operated day and night, burning 100 tons of the city's waste each day. That thing would run early in the morning, late in the evening. Trucks. I mean, 100 trucks coming and dropping that mess off. Our bus is lined up on the side where Old Smokey is. And we had to stand out there and wait for the bus to come. And if they were still burning at that time, it was horrible. Sometimes we'd go sit in the gym until it was time for the bus to come. As early as 1941, newspaper articles reported strong community opposition to the incinerator. It was viewed as an unsightly mess and in constant need of repair. And the poor people that lived down there on Washington, I mean, they caught the blues. They got it all. They got the, the smell, the fumes, the, excuse me, the maggots, and everything else around there, you know. It was just, just terrible around there. You can really see the devastation this community has suffered from. The waste to energy plant there now that went up in flames about a month ago, that took not 100 tons a day, but 3,000 tons a day. Wow. And that's the opposite side of the county. It just two different parts of the county suffering from the same issues at very different points in history. History often rhymes, and we shouldn't allow it to in this case. This is what Tyler was talking about, the Covanta fire. A new details tonight about the waste plant fire in Doral. Five days after it ignited, officials say the flames are still burning. And tonight, there are growing concerns about air quality in the area. CBS 4's Naja Sherman joins us live with the latest warning from the city. Naja? Yeah, Lauren and Jim, the big concern tonight is for people who live near that plant. This evening, the city of Doral sent out a tweet. Take a look. It is urging residents who live within a two-mile radius of the plant to stay inside. We created this graphic to give you a closer look at the area's impact that we're talking about here. It is a significant circumference affecting a lot of people. And Tyler, you said something about the air flows, which caused this to travel beyond that two mile radius, right? Yeah, I mean, all those particulate matter, NOx and emissions, even though they're filtered, they're still being emitted. I mean, it's not like 100% filtration of this waste energy plant. They are and have been getting more stringent with air quality from those smoke stacks and the ash, but ultimately it's still permitted pollution because there is a waste. So we wanted to point out, as we mentioned briefly before, the Ocean Conservancy and you had the University of Georgia's New Materials Institute did the circularity assessment protocol of Miami. So if you want to check out that report, they'll teach you a lot. It gives a good holistic perspective of all the different stakeholders in policy, economics, government, civil society, academia, who all need to get involved in making the county and city more circular. This report was also supported by Florida International University and the city of Miami itself. And we're going to move on pretty fast here to go through some quick things to consider in policy. We should really be focusing on innovation, human health, environmental health. When you're doing your policy planning, you want to be, as we've said before, more proactive, not reactive. 
integrating your innovation and your subsidies or your tax benefits to what is best for the long-term futures, not just being stuck in thinking about the existing technologies that are often a hundred years old or just like a hole in the ground and burning trash with fire. You need to have this proper use of taxpayer money. Procurement is one of the best ways to look at policy because the government is often the biggest buyer in any economy. Florida taxpayer money is being used on these facilities. We need to put policy before politics, which is one of the most critical ways for America to move forward in many regards of policy, but especially when it comes to zero waste, environmental and solving socioeconomic inequalities. So when you're doing policy for waste management, it should tackle mitigation of reducing greenhouse gases. Tyler, would you like to actually speak real quickly to why greenhouse gases are such a critical issue with incinerators? Well, yeah, you not only have greenhouse gases coming out of the flu stacks, but you also have emissions from the ash itself. At the SWANA event a few weeks ago, I learned that there is a significant amount of methane emissions just coming from the ash itself. Not many people, and I didn't certainly know that, but that is a major concern. And then landfills, as they are right now, they're the leading human-caused greenhouse gas emissions from the methane of all the landfills. They're not all being degassed and utilized that methane for beneficial purposes. They're drastically behind the curve there, and we continue to pile on significantly more landfill waste and debris, especially after storms and pandemics. There's a growing concern that we need to address rapidly, as well as the forever chemicals that are being found in our waste streams, in our blood streams, in our water streams. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. I'd like to also point out in various places like Africa, you could cover landfills just by a bit more soil where you have better measures where you're not enabling that methane to go up into the atmosphere. There's a lot of great science being done out there, and it's one of the quickest ways to diminish the rate in which our planet is getting more hot as we are trying to address the hot planet repair team. Not only could these policies include mitigation adaptation, they can focus on how we restore our climate to pre-industrial greenhouse gas pollution levels by including carbon capture technologies into future waste management systems. Like we mentioned before, what you subsidize is really important. So there's things you shouldn't be supporting. There's things you should be supporting. Various states in the U.S. have, have good standards, which could be improved. We're not going to focus on that too much more today because we have to get more into what are the policy ingredients for innovation, demonstrating and deploying the best technologies and systems. You can use a lot of different kinds of support mechanisms, even tax incentives like 45Q, direct payment schemes. All these different kinds of systemic levers will help foster that. You can have disruptive production where you share knowledge from different use cases. Having the right authorities and financial structuring is really critical as well. What citizen oversight do you have? Committees with the right businesses getting involved. If you want to learn more about higher level national policy, there's a great readout from a few weeks ago, the White House Circular Economy and Innovation Roundtable that was co-hosted with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. You can see why they're really focusing on innovation, supply chain management, tracking, reporting, and traceability, all the stuff that we're focusing on here at Hot Planet Repair Team in Carvatura. So Tyler, would you like to actually bring us right into that? Why should Miami-Dade be focusing on recyclotrons? Really, it's out of necessity. The mayor is very committed towards a zero waste county. In that regard, it has to be zero waste and landfills and incinerators are not. Recyclotrons have zero waste. There are zero emissions and 100% of the materials are recycled. Some communities are also cash strapped for the amount of sunk costs they've gone into antiquated remediation technologies. So they don't necessarily have the budget always to have a tremendous amount of money invested. The business model around Carbatura and the Recyclotrons is that all that front-end CapEx is already paid for. As long as there's a long-term commitment for the waste stream and a guarantee around that, ultimately that provides the business model for Carbatura to come in to provide a virtual endless landfill and create renewable materials to re-enter the supply chain. That creates tremendous resilience for the local community. It also allows for community development funds for the disadvantaged community to have a fair shot, but also it helps everybody in the community. It creates more resilience, more sustainability, and zero waste. Thank you, Tyler. And these are just some of the waste that we love. Normal municipal solid waste, different kinds of biomass. You can even get some blue-green algae in there that Florida is dealing with. Sargassum, tires, sludge from industrial waste and, and large bales. There's pointing out like what would a beach look like with its waste coming up and you got lots of different kinds of dead animal, debris, plastics, hazardous waste, and those tough algae blooms that we mentioned. Tyler, would you like to talk a little bit about reporting and tracking? 
Sure. Reporting and tracking is important because what you don't measure, you can't fix. When we're talking about zero waste and zero emissions, we want to make sure that we track where the trash is coming from and who to get credit back for any recycling fees and provide rebates back to them. This is 44 tons of municipal solid waste on one flat pack container. And in the recyclotrons, you basically put each bale into the reactor so it doesn't have to be separated because we're separating molecules. We're not separating trash. Ultimately, this creates a very streamlined operation instead of having a bunch of trash trucks and trash trains going everywhere. This provides a 100% circular solution for municipal solid waste and all waste streams, sludge, ash, construction and demolition that don't necessarily get included into the typical municipal solid waste figures. We can take all waste, agricultural, plastics, biomass, especially when we've got a giant bloom of algae about to come to the shores of the east coast of Florida. We can take all of that algae and all of that seaweed and process that. Amazing. We just want to quickly end off the presentation here showing the great community-led untrashing that's going on in Miami-Dade. You can check out some of these groups and what they're up to, help clean up the beaches with them. We think it's important to point out the, the allies we can find in business in the county, these great SMEs being helped by groups like Seaworthy Collective. These entrepreneurs are going to be solving all of our problems, and we need to work with them to manage our coastal ecosystems, water, and waste. And then these bigger industries, like the finance industry that just moved down to Southeast Florida, has a, a role to play with our local communities. The healthcare industry, the cruise capital of the world, which has a ridiculous amount of waste and pollution, and the food, entertainment, and the hospitality. All these allies have a role to play, and we're excited to meet you and see how we can get things going. So thank you all for your time today. Appreciate it. And next time, tune in to check out New England, where we're going to focus on the history of trashing and untrashing there, both where Tyler and I grew up. So thanks. Awesome. See you next time. Thanks, everybody.